Track 15. Hello and welcome to Smith's Gym. Hi there. I'd like to become a member. Yes, of course. We just need to fill out a couple of forms and then I can show you around the gym. That would be great. Let's start with the membership form. Can I have your name, please? Yes, sure. Brad Simmons. Is that Simmons with a D or without? Without. S I double M O N S. The customer says that his surname is Simmons, so this is written as the answer. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to three. Hello, and welcome to Smith's Gym. Hi there. I'd like to become a member. Yes, of course. We just need to fill out a couple of forms and then I can show you around the gym. That would be great. Let's start with the membership form. Can I have your name, please? Yes, sure. Brad Simmons. Is that Simmons with a D or without? Without. S I double M O N S. Got it. And can I take a contact number, please? Yes, sure. It's 04983. Treble five two one. Okay, zero four nine eight three five 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 three one. No, uh, it's two one at the end. Great. And do you have an email address? Yes, Brad zero seven at elmnet dot com. That's e l e m n e t dot com. Right. Now. We've got three membership types here: bronze, which is just off peak and costs twenty-one pounds a month; silver, which means you can use the gym at all times. This is thirty-six pounds fifty, or for just five pounds more, you can get a gold membership, which gives you free access to the squash and tennis courts and all classes. For now, I think I'll just take the silver. That's fine, sir. That'll be thirty-six pounds fifty a month. Great. When can I start? Well, you'll need to have an induction first. We have spaces at two thirty, four forty-five, and eight fifteen tomorrow. Would any of these be suitable? I can't do tomorrow. Do you have anything for Saturday? Is that the twelfth of November? No, it's the eleventh. Yes, yes, that's fine. Would two thirty be okay? That's fine. I'll book you in with our trainer Rob Ellis. Now, would you like me to show you around? That would be great. Track sixteen. Okay, follow me. Let's go up the stairs to the main equipment room. As you can see, we have all the treadmills, bikes, and rowing machines in here, and the weights are in the corner. Great. And is that the pool over there? Can I use that with my membership? Yes, at any time. Just go through the glass doors on the left. As you can see, the pool is dominated by the diving board at the far end. It's impressively tall. And on the right-hand side of the pool, you can see we have two lanes. The first one is a slow lane for those who are trying to improve their fitness. It gets really busy. The lane on the far right is what we call the club lane because we reserve this for people who have membership. It is slightly less busy, and the members can get a really good workout in it. That sounds great. Yes, it is good. And then near us, you can see a smaller area sectioned off nearly halfway across the pool. This area is where we put the school groups, which come in the late afternoons during the week, usually from about four. We keep them confined to that space so that the other end can be used for free swimming. And what is the little round pool for? We call that the toddlers' pool. It's not very deep, and the mothers often bring their children in to teach them to swim in it. Great. Well, I'm glad I can use the pool. It will be good to vary my exercise. Definitely. When do you think you'll be coming? Most likely in the evenings. I'd like to come on Saturdays, but I often work then, so I think I'll have to miss that day and then come on Sundays. Oh, so you'll be a regular visitor. That's great news. Can I ask why you chose Smith's Gym? Well, actually, the television advert prompted me to join. It makes exercising look so much fun. I always thought going to the gym would be monotonous. No, not at all. It can be a lot of fun. My aim is to reach my optimum fitness. At the moment, I think I'm a bit unhealthy, so I'd like to change that. 
Well, give it some time and I'm sure you will. Now, shall we go back and complete the payment details? Track 18 Good morning, everyone. I'd like to talk to you all about the department restructure and how it will affect our work. As you know, the company is expanding and this means we'll need to recruit more staff and optimise our ways of working. So I want to look at each of our teams and the changes which are planned to start next month. The sales team, headed by Gary Wilson, will be responsible for not only increasing the amount of business we do with our current customers, but also searching out new clients. As this is likely to be a labour-intensive task, Gary's team will need more staff, which is where Linda French's human resources team comes in. Linda and Gary will collaborate on finding and employing 20 new sales members as soon as possible. However, not all staff will be recruited from outside. If this company is going to continue to thrive, each of the current team managers will need an assistant and these positions will be internal appointments. Human Resources are sending out an email to all staff this week asking them if they would like to apply for one of the new positions and interviews will begin next month. Now, in order for the sales team to increase revenue, the research and development team have to come up with some innovative products which will be better than those offered by other companies. Therefore, Zoe's team will start a month-long project to learn more about what our competitors make to help inform our design process. Their target will be to design and create two new ranges of products this year. As always, if any of you have an idea for a product, please contact Zoe about it. All ideas are welcome. Lastly, but just as importantly, I'd like to talk about Ian Smith's team. Obviously, aftercare service is crucial to the expansion of the company, so IT support will be making sure that all our customers are called to discuss our service as part of the follow-up system. Ian's team will also be upgrading our client support package to facilitate 24-hour access, seven days a week. Ian believes strongly that this will increase our competitiveness and be a real selling point for potential customers. Track 19 Welcome to this fire evacuation talk, everyone. I'm Melanie Brooks, the fire safety manager here at TechBase, and my office is on the fourth floor if you ever need to find me. Today, I want to run through the fire evacuation procedure now that we're in a new building. First of all, can I just remind you that if you hear the fire alarm, you should always head towards the main stairs in order to leave the building. Please assume that the alarm is real, except if it sounds at 11am on a Tuesday. At this time, it's always a test, we hope. It's vital that you do not spend time collecting your bags or personal belongings because this wastes valuable evacuation time. When you have left the building... Please look for the fire marshals who will be wearing fluorescent orange jackets. They'll show you where the waiting area is, but just so you know, it's the park at the rear of the office block. Your department has a fire safety officer, I believe it's Susan Jenkins, and it's her job to make sure that everyone who signed in has vacated the building. Susan will then tell the fire safety manager if there are any missing people. Can I also remind you that you mustn't enter the building again until the fire safety manager, in other words me, tells you that the situation is no longer dangerous. Track 20 Right team, this afternoon I want to go over the new marketing and advertising strategy so that everyone is clear on the streams for each of our product ranges. Let's start with toys for children. Now, Last year, most of the advertising was done through leaflets posted through people's letterboxes across the city. However, the products are now selling well nationally in department stores rather than just in our local shop here in Leeds. So, we're going to expand the budget and use print media. By this, I mean the national newspapers, in order to maximise the exposure to these products. And despite the fact that our competitors advertise baby clothes on TV, we won't be using this method as our statistics show that it's just not cost-effective. People don't pay much attention to TV ads for baby clothes, but we believe a picture in the newspapers will be much more attractive to potential customers. We're going with this method. 
As far as clothing for expectant mothers is concerned, the campaign will move from newspapers to the internet due to the fact that we've seen an increase in internet shopping for clothes among women in general. And finally, baby food. Adverts for this are difficult to place, and we've previously tried ads in all three media. Anyway, although our analysis has shown that the internet is one possibility, we're going to continue using television. Many other types of food are also advertised on TV, and happy mothers and babies make a very strong image. Track 21 I'd like to start by welcoming everyone to our annual meeting and thanking you all for your hard work. It's been a great year for us in terms of expansion and optimising business opportunities, and I'm pleased to say that Benchmark Consulting is a thriving, successful company. I'd like to take this opportunity to give you an overview of where the company began and where we'll be going in the next 10 years. For those of you who've been with the company since the start, sorry if you already know all this, but we have so many new staff members that I thought it would be worth filling in some background information. Benchmark Consulting was set up in 2000 by James Cox, a local entrepreneur who opened the first office in Melbourne. His real achievement was to create a new consultancy system which enabled clients to see which of the key areas of their business needed strengthening. James was incredibly successful with his system and started the company off on a journey of expansion. He retired in 2006 and was succeeded by Fred Montgomery. Fred shared James's views on consulting and continued the expansion. He increased revenue to $5 million and opened a new office in Perth. Soon the benchmark consulting system had become just that, the benchmark for many other consulting firms, and Fred took the opportunity to sell Benchmark for $10 million in 2008. Our new owners are, as you know, TFB Group Limited, and their investment has allowed us to build our brand new headquarters here in Sydney. TFB Group have brought us more exposure at a national level, and our most recent success has been winning a contract with the Government of Australia, advising on management restructuring. Now, we ourselves have done a little reorganisation over the last year to maximise our productivity. We've thought long and hard about the best location for the marketing department, as this is the key to facilitating our future business. Although Perth has a large number of marketing companies, which enables us to learn from our competitors, it's Melbourne that's the gateway to international connections, and therefore we've decided to move all marketing operations there. In terms of professional development, we wanted to optimise the training programmes available to our staff because training is vital if we want to remain competitive. As a result, staff training will no longer be here in Sydney, but instead will take place in the Perth office, where new facilities have been installed. Finally, we've looked at how to optimise our back office administrative functions. Currently, each office has its own admin department. However, this is proving to be less efficient than we would like. In order to resolve this situation, all these functions will now be centralised here in Sydney. Track 22 So, what does all this mean for the future? Well, after 10 years... I've decided that Benchmark needs a new vision for the future. I think it's time for us to divide up parts of the business into smaller units. Therefore, over the next five years, I aim to set up two small subsidiary companies in order to focus on international expansion in Europe and Asia. There are many organisations in emerging markets which could benefit from our experience and skills. Which leads me to the next point for future development, that of increasing our workforce. It's become clear that all our departments are understaffed, so we'll be taking on more employees over the next year. And the really good news is that to make us a desirable employer, all positions, current and future, will receive a salary increase of 10%. Lastly, I know that some people are worried about the financial aspects of having to move to another city as part of the restructure, 
so Benchmark will be providing a relocation package to all employees thus affected. This is because we would like you all to remain with the company for the foreseeable future. Track 28 Morning, everyone. How are you? Fine, thanks, Joe. Yeah, fine, Joe. Have you managed to do much research on our Minority Languages project? Well, Julia, I've been having some trouble finding information about the number of Cornish speakers in the UK. The records at the Office of National Statistics and the Cornish Language Council say different things, so I'm not sure who to believe. Hmm. Susan, have you got any information about this? I was looking on the government's Minority Languages website and it says that nearly half the minority language speakers in the UK are speakers of Welsh. Are you sure it's nearly half? I thought the number of Gaelic and Welsh speakers was more or less the same. It used to be when Gaelic was a compulsory subject in schools, but nowadays there are fewer speakers of Gaelic compared to Welsh. And apparently, with Cornish, it's difficult to know the exact percentage of the population who speak it, because most people only speak it to intermediate level. Very few people are fluent speakers. I suppose that's why the statistics are different. Well, I think we should go with the more conservative estimate based on the number of fluent speakers. I think you're right, which means that Cornish isn't spoken by nearly as many people as the other languages. Yes, I think that's right too. Based on fluent speakers, that means that Welsh is the most widely spoken and the numbers of Irish and Gaelic speakers are more or less the same. Track 29 Right, Harry, Rob, shall we get started on this presentation for European studies? Well, how about if I start by talking about the central regions of Spain where most people speak Spanish? Good idea. It's important we make it clear that the majority of the population use Spanish as their main language. Then I can introduce the Galician accent of the northwest. But isn't Galician more of a dialect? Oh, yes, you're right. We've got to get our terminology correct, because Spain is complicated in terms of languages and dialects and accents. How about we then move across to the northeast, and I give details on the Basque language and how it's different from Spanish? That seems logical, Stephanie. Do you also want to mention the other language in the northeast? It's Catalan, isn't it? Yes. In fact, we should say it's the official language of the region to show how important it is. So, what am I going to present? We need to include something about accents and speaking styles, don't we? Of course. I could explain the difficulties of understanding the accent in the south due to the fact that the locals speak quickly. Excellent. Well, I think that covers everything. Shall we meet tomorrow to practice our presentation? Track 30 So, Natalie, Louise, how are you doing with your report on encouraging people to speak local languages? Fine, thanks, Dr Phillips. It's been really interesting. We've found lots of information which we've collated for our report. Good. What are you going to focus on? Well, many schools and colleges are doing good work promoting local languages, both as qualifications and in terms of after-school clubs. And then there's the rise in popularity of minority language music, which seems to be driven by tourism. Tourists who are exposed to songs in indigenous languages become interested in learning those languages. OK, now you need to be careful with these topics. They are fascinating but you need to look at the influences which drive language learning. Education doesn't leave people much choice, and music isn't a strong enough factor. Do you have any suggestions for us? Well, what did we talk about in last week's seminar? Can you remember any of the real push factors? Do you mean things like communication and relationships between companies and their workers? It's much more powerful than music, don't you think? Yes, I see what you mean. So, I suppose our other idea isn't very strong either. We also thought about hobby groups, but I'm beginning to think they're less significant. Yes, there aren't sufficient hobbyist groups to make a real difference to local language learning. But think about something else which is similar, but reaches a much larger proportion of the population of a country or community. Ah, like online discussion groups. I remember in the lecture you talked about how the internet is fueling the increase in local languages through the World Languages Project. 
This is more appropriate for your report because we can actually measure the amount of correspondence in each language and chart increases and decreases over time, which makes it a more rigorous form of analysis. Of course. So we should definitely include that in our report. It's becoming clearer now. We need to write about the larger factors involving commerce and online communication where we can record language usage. I think it's better than looking at anecdotal information. Thanks, Dr Phillips. Track 31 So, we need to get this field trip sorted out as soon as possible, don't we? Yes, let's get started. James, have you worked out which two countries we should travel to? Well, I thought we could go to the USA and Mexico because that's where the populations of most native languages are concentrated. But then I found out that the three languages we're most interested in are more widely spoken in Canada than Mexico, so I think we should go there instead. OK. Anna, weren't you going to think about our research focus? Yes, and I think I've found two areas that would work well. Firstly, use of the three languages, Nardani, Salishan and Algic, among the younger generation, people up to the age of 25. I found out that although there are many older speakers of Algic, it's used much less by the young. In fact, young people under the age of 25 use both Nardani and Salishan more than Algic. That's interesting. That means that native language use isn't really being affected by the older generations anymore. So what's the other focus area then, Anna? Well, it would be good to try to find out what affects changes in native language speaker populations. You mean things like family life and the influence of popular culture or tourism? Yes, areas like that, but not tourism or culture because they're too general. I think we should look at whether family has an impact in terms of passing on native language use, and possibly the effects of government language policy too. Government figures can be deceptive, but they're still worth looking at. Maybe we should also focus on something like job creation and work statistics and the number of people who leave the USA to live in another country instead. Hmm, yes. I think emigration would be as useful as language policy. OK, then. Let's focus on those three, as well as what happens in families. Track 32 Well, shall we look at our route now? Most of the speakers we're looking for are in California, so we could start there. We can spend two weeks travelling around and meeting people to get some background information and then start collecting data. What do you think about beginning in the southwest corner of the state and visiting the Barona Reservation? Mm, that's a good idea. We'll be able to get some interviews with native language speakers there. And then we could go to the Eastern Mountains to visit the local education authority of North County. They've got a native language project for school children. Why there? Wouldn't it be better to go to the education department in San Diego? It's bigger. But they focus more on Spanish and English bilingualism and less on native languages. In that case, the North County Education Authority will be more valuable, so let's do that. After that, we could head southeast to the town of Bishop. There's a company there called Cotec, which employs only bilingual speakers. I've emailed the managing director, who's happy to give us an interview. Oh, that's great work, James. It sounds like something we should definitely do. Right. Well, I'll email her to confirm. Also, we should go to Sun City. It's this bilingual town in the south-central area of the region. They have a policy whereby all signs in the town must be in the local language as well as English. We can take photos of these signs. They'll make good visuals for our report. But won't that be intrusive for the people who live there? No, they're used to it. The village is used as a model for other communities who'd like to do the same thing. In that case, let's add it to the itinerary. Track 33. The assistant says the dresses are on the left, so left is written as the answer. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Excuse me, where are the dresses? They're at the end of this aisle, on the left. Can I help you with anything? Yes, maybe... I'm not from around here, so I don't know this store. Well, I can help you with anything you need. Fantastic. 
I'm actually down here for my brother's wedding, and I need something to wear. I've just started a new job, and I haven't had time to get anything yet. I'm looking for something smart. Maybe a new dress. Well, what about this one? I think it's too hot for long sleeves. Yes. Well,、uh, this one has shorter sleeves, and it still has the bow, which I think is a nice detail.、Uh, or there's this patterned one. I'm not keen on a pattern. I think I'll go for the one with the bow. Do you have it in a size ten? Let me have a look.、Uh, yes, here. Great. I need a hat, and then I can try them on together. What kind of hat are you looking for? What about this one with the flower? Yes, but if I may suggest, a taller hat would add to your height. Really? Yes. Try this one. Oh, I see what you mean. We have this style with the single flower. Or with a small bunch, and it comes with a, a wide or narrow brim. I like the narrow brim and just the one flower. Hmm. Can I have a blue flower? I'm afraid it just comes in cream. Well, it goes with the dress anyway. Great. I'll place an order and have the hat sent to you. It'll take about two days to be delivered. Is that okay? Yes, that's fine. I need to take down a few details for delivery. Can I take your name? Ellen Barker. And the delivery address? It'll be my brother's address. It's fifteen, no, fourteen Brightwell Avenue. Fourteen.、Uh, can you spell that, please? Yes, B R I G H T W E L L Avenue, Staybridge, Kent, D A four seven D F. And can I take a contact number? Yes, my mobile is zero three double two one triple seven four. Zero three double two one triple seven five. No, it's a four at the end. Oh, sorry, I've got it now. We can deliver on May the twelfth. We can't specify an exact time, just morning or afternoon. Any time in the early morning is fine. And how would you like to pay? Visa. Great, that comes to thirty-two pounds twenty-five. Okay, thanks. Track thirty-four. I'm just going to try this dress on and then look for shoes. Where are the changing rooms? They're to the left of the store, right next to customer services. And I want some shoes and accessories too. Where can I find them? The accessories are in the women's wear department. The shoe department is right at the front of the store. Between menswear and home furnishings. Oh no! Sorry, <laughs> we've just moved the shoe department for the summer season. It's now very near the changing rooms, actually, straight in front of them. Thanks so much for your help. And where can I pay for the other things? The cash desk is at the front of the store by the menswear. Thanks. Track thirty-five. Welcome to San Fernando City Tours. I'm Mark, your tour guide. We have a lot to see in three hours, so make sure you're comfortable. We'll be traveling into the historical district first, and then into the town center. After that, it's out to the harbor, and we'll finish up at the lighthouse just past the harbor. That will take us up to midday, and after that, you're free to do what you want. At the lighthouse, you'll have a chance to visit the tea room and take photographs of the magnificent coastline. Now, as we have only three hours, we won't be able to take you around the shopping district. But we think you'd prefer to look around the shops there in your own time, anyway. San Fernando has some well-known tourist attractions: the lighthouse, for example, and the National Library. However, the little-known military museum is not to be missed. Be sure to visit before you leave. Now, there's a lot to do in San Fernando. Indeed, there really is something for everyone. For those who love the water, I can recommend a trip on the Seafarer, one of the most famous boats on the San Fernando River. It does an evening trip with a three-course meal included. It's great fun for everyone, but especially for young people in their teens or twenties. After nine, there's a disco on the boat, and it gets really lively. Then there's a climbing wall near the town center. It's incredibly popular, with a large wall for expert climbers and a smaller wall for novices. There is a junior wall and a crèche, so it's a great day out for those of you with kids. 
And if you like walking, there's some great walking tours. The city sites tour is highly recommended, as is the walking tour by the coast. But that one's only for the fit, not really suitable for children or the elderly. For more mature people, or those less able to get around, I would suggest a tour around the vineyards. It can be done in the luxury of a coach, and it's a wonderful way to explore the region's wines. Track 36 Naturally, there's a charge for all these attractions, but you can get 15% off if you have an Explorer Pass. If you don't have a pass but would like one, the driver here has application forms. Just ask him for one and fill it out while on the tour. Then you hand it into the tour office. Normally, it costs $10, but this year it's just $7. When you hand it in, you'll get your picture taken for the card on the spot, and then your card is ready to use. Remember to show it whenever you pay for anything. The discounts apply not just to tourist attractions, but some bars and restaurants. Basically, everywhere you see a red explorer symbol. Ah, we're coming up to the historical district now. If you'd like to look at Track 37. Hi, Katie. Hi, Ian. Come on in. Hi, Professor Gordon. We wanted to talk to you about our wildlife presentation next week. Have you decided how to organise it? Yes, Professor. At first, we were going to focus on the cat family, but then we decided to talk about nocturnal animals instead. Yes, good idea. And how is your planning going? It's going well. We think we have enough material for 20 minutes. The advantage is that there are so many visual aids we can use. We found lots on the internet which we think will be really interesting for people. The problem is that this topic has been hard to narrow down. If anything, we've got too much information for just 20 minutes. How do you think we could narrow it down further? It is a broad subject. There are a few ways you could do it, but I'd recommend just looking at a representative sample of nocturnal animals, just four or five. Yes, and maybe we could choose one animal from each continent, or a land creature, a marine creature and a winged animal. I like the idea of separating it by different types of animals. And if we limit the detail, we'll definitely have enough time. But don't limit the detail too much. Also, think how you're going to interest the audience. Well, we're going to have a picture for each animal so we can talk through the picture. That's a nice idea, but don't limit yourself to pictures. If you can find any clips of the animals, use them. Showing brief video clips can keep an audience interested. I'll look on the internet tonight. And think of questions to ask your audience. People like to be involved. Yes, that's a great idea. Anyway, Professor, we've been practising our presentation and we'd like to show you a small section. Is that OK? Well, we just have a couple of minutes left, but go ahead. Track 38 Well, we were thinking of presenting each animal with a picture and describing their physical characteristics. OK, but not in too much detail. That's just background information. We'll start with the jaguar. I'll introduce it by saying that the jaguar is a nocturnal animal and the only species of the genus Panthera to be found in the Americas. Like any cat, it has whiskers and it can move quickly. Its spine has great movement, meaning a jaguar can take long strides, sometimes up to five and a half metres. This can make it a deadly predator, as you can imagine. Moving on to the fur, its fur is quite distinct. The markings are like black donut-shaped spots on its otherwise yellow fur. People often confuse them with a leopard for this reason. Now, the tail is interesting. Although people think that the tail has stripes on it, the fur on the tail actually is similar to the body, with black circles around the lower section. The jaguar is generally a creature to be feared. Oh yes, I should have mentioned this earlier. Sorry, like most cats, it has sharp, retractable claws. Yes, that's fine, but be careful. The jaguar is usually thought of as nocturnal, but strictly speaking, it's crepuscular. In other words, most active between dusk and dawn. But as long as you mention this, you can put it under the umbrella of nocturnal. Is that all? Yes, I think so. Thanks, Professor. Track 39 
The measurement of time has come a long way since ancient times. It began with such devices as the sundial, where the position of the sun's shadow marked the hour. Daylight was divided into twelve temporary hours. These temporary hours were longer in the summer and shorter in the winter, simply because the amount of daylight changes with the seasons. The earliest sundial we know comes from Egypt. It was made of stone and is thought to date from 1500 BC. Sundials were used throughout the classical world and, with time, evolved into more elaborate devices that could take into account seasonal changes and geographical positioning and reflect the hours accurately, no matter what the time of year. This was quite an achievement in technology. Today, sundials can be seen as decorative pieces in many gardens. In the 11th century, the Chinese invented the first mechanical clocks. They were large and expensive, and certainly not intended for individuals. However, this is the type of clock we are familiar with today. There have been many developments in clocks and watches since then, and they have been greatly improved. But if your clock or watch makes a ticking sound, then it could well be based on the mechanical movements the Chinese developed a thousand years ago. However, timekeeping has moved on from the mechanical clock. Time has become so important that there is a series of atomic clocks around the world which measure international atomic time. Even though many countries have their own calendars, globalization has made it essential that we measure time uniformly. So that we know, for example, that when it's 6am in the United Kingdom, it's 2pm in Beijing. This standard was set in 1958. Now these atomic clocks are situated in over 70 laboratories all over the world. There is so much to cover about the development of time measurement that I would like to refer you to the reading list. The core text is The Development of Time, Theory and Practice, but there are many other useful texts. A good grounding in the subject is given in Understanding Time by J. R. Beale. Although some sections lack detailed analyses, it does offer a good foundation. Also, Time, Concepts and Conventions is quite a useful read. You might think from the title that it's about the philosophy of time, but this isn't the case. Rather, it gives a good description of how different countries have different approaches to time in terms of calendars and days. Lastly, The Story of Time by David Harris analyses time in great detail, and I would recommend this book if you are aiming to specialise in horology. Now, we're going to continue with an in-depth look at lunar and solar cycles.